Oh, welcome back to The Late Show with Howard Condor. I've, I've done a late show for so long, and it's really nice to be back in the studio live. I want to say I am live. I just finished playing football, so if it's, I smell a little bit, it's only because, you know, it's to be expected. It comes straight off the field. But talking of the field, we want to play the field with you tonight. We're going to be talking to Pastor Derek Walker from Oxford Bible Church. Thank you very much, Derek, Thank you, for Howard. joining Great to us. Be here. Long time no see. Yeah, it has, has it? Yeah. yeah. Good to be uh, back. You're getting younger. Is that, is that, is well, that that's down the plan. to the wife? That's the plan, yes. <laughs> she helps, <Yeah>. for sure. <laughs> well, Derek, you're well known for your knowledge of Scripture, and, and uh, especially on end times. Now, for some of our viewers, they might think, well, you know, they just joined Christian television first time. You know, take it steady, because the thing is that you might learn something tonight which might just provoke you to a little bit of fear because we are living in interesting times and very dangerous times. But the Bible talks about critical times, hard to deal with, would be upon a certain generation. And Derek Walker will certainly be the one to answer some of your questions. So we'll almost make it a Q&A tonight. So Derek, if that's all right with you? Fine, absolutely. You know, so just give a little bit of background again because we've got new viewers and uh, they'd like to know Oxford Bible Church. Is that something that's because you live in the area or, of Oxford or...? Yes, we, I, I went to the university uh, many years ago, and even then I, I became a Christian, actually, in my first term at university. I went up to study maths. I thought I'd become a maths professor, but God had other plans. And uh, even then, during my time in Oxford, Oxford felt like home. And I realise now it was, the, it was a call of God on my life, actually, that, that caused me to want to stay in Oxford. And um, I did some school teaching in maths for a bit. And then eventually, you know, God called us to, to start Oxford Bible Church. You which us. is about 20, my wife and I, Hilary, yes. yeah. my lovely wife, Hilary. And uh, that, that's about 26 years ago. We started in our lounge, you know, and it's grown from there. So uh, we meet in Heading, Cheney School in Headington in Oxford. Great. Now, Derek. It's unusual, because normally when people go to university, that's when they lose their Christianity. It's almost like that goes out the window. They yeah. start to party and they find out there's another side to life, which they think is fun. Because uh, Christianity in itself might not be such uh, a fun time, because it is quite serious, isn't it? And especially these days. So for you to have um, gone the other way and sort of say, hang on a sec, uh, you know, there's something in the Bible that connected with you. What was it? Well, it was, a, looking back, I can see how, how amazing it was. We didn't, we weren't a Christian family, although I suppose we were nominally Christian, perhaps. Maybe visit church once a year or something. And, and you know, I found myself in the summer holidays. It, well, my ambition was to make it to Oxford. My mum encouraged me in that. And so that was my big thing. And so when I made it to Oxford, I thought, my dreams have come true. And, and I felt that way for a few weeks, and then I felt empty again. And In the summer holiday leading up to going to Oxford, I was getting all this kind of spiritual, I don't know where, it, well, I know now where it was coming from, but this desire to study the Bible, and uh, I'd play Handel's Messiah a lot, and uh, I, I had even a kind of inner mental vision of being in this student group, you know, kind of with a guitar and all, all the students together. And I, I'd never been in a Christian fellowship at all, but I kind of saw myself. It was like the Holy Spirit was preparing me for when I actually went up to Oxford and I immediately fell among the Christians. And I saw something in their life that told me they had something. And they took me to church and I heard the gospel for the first time. And it was just, it was exciting to me to realize, you know, that God loves me, that, you know, uh, that Jesus died for me, that I could have the gift of eternal life. You know, it, it wasn't like this fifth sense of, oh, you know, it was really hard and serious stuff. It was just exciting to realize mm -hmm. this stuff is true. And it, after a few weeks investigating the, the evidence and all the rest, I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus, and uh, yeah, haven't really looked back. So I didn't really see it as something that was like serious. Of course, it is serious, but it was just just fresh and exciting. You know, like a whole new world was opened up to me. How well did you do <coughs> at Oxford? Oh, I got I, I squeaked my first. Did you? Well, <laughs> I squeaked my first. Very good. I got um, I went off track a bit in my second year, 
and I didn't really give due diligence to my work. I, in a sense, I got too spiritual, if that's yes. not the right word, but I think I you know what I mean. Yeah. And I put my work aside, I thought it wasn't important. And then as I come into the third year, I realized I was losing my way. And I, I realized that, no, God had sent me to Oxford. God wanted me to do well, to glorify him, even just as a witness to my parents. And so I got serious in the third year. Unfortunately, the Oxford system actually rewarded let me off for my second year lapse and rewarded the third year work. And so I remember my tutor's face, he was shocked when I got a first because I hadn't really shown that I had that in me. But I managed to claw my way up there. I, I could have got a really good first if I would have, ser what was if your I would first have fulfilled in? my potential, put it that way. But I, I, I squeaked it. <laughs> and what was your first in? Oh, what? mathematics. Okay. Yeah. Now, that accounts for the fact that you take uh, a lot of the numerical prophecies uh, very seriously and you've investigated them. And the reason <clears throat> I wanted people to hear what your testimony is in, is in regards to how well you did Oxford is that, you know, some people have that idea that a Christian is someone who's easily uh, fooled or convinced. Yes, we don't throw away our minds when we become Christians. We should love the Lord with all our heart, soul, and mind. Mm -hmm. And so I very much believe that uh, God, God gave us minds that we should use. <laughs> so intellectually, you're, uh, you're way out there as well, that, which is what I'm trying to bring out here, so that sure. anybody listening today could, uh, there's more credibility in the fact that there's someone who's uh, gone to Oxford to study and to come out with the first, and at the same time, come to a knowledge of what's in the scripture. Now, what was it in the scripture that really um, brought you, or drew, drew you in and gave you confidence that the scriptures were uh, credible? There are a number of things. I mean, just the whole consistency of the scriptures, which keeps impressing me continually. In fact, one gets revelation just by comparing scripture against scripture and seeing patterns. And, and I realize that this can only be explained um, by the fact that God is the author. But uh, at the time, one of the major things was the messianic prophecies, the very specific prophecies that the Messiah would fulfill. And that's how we recognize who the Messiah is, you know, where he would be born. And uh, you already mentioned the time prophecies, Daniel 70 weeks, how that predicts exactly when Jesus would die and rise again. Uh, and Isaiah 53, so many of these amazing, not just Nostradamus type prophecies, but very precise information that only one man could ever fulfill. And so that was very convincing that God, you know, of the supernatural nature of the Bible. That's, for <clears throat> me, that's what did it as mm. well. When I started studying scripture at the age 21, um, not highly educated like yourself, but nevertheless, it, it was, there that a simple person could actually see that the Bible had something quite unique and yeah. it was prophecies again I was thinking how could something be foretold the way it was so uniquely so clearly going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 for yeah. example and seeing the messianic uh, promises and the lineage that had to follow I mean it couldn't have all it had to it would have had to have been written uh, almost like today mm or at least 2,000 yeah. years ago, not three and a half thousand years ago. God says, I declare yeah. the end from the beginning. Yeah. That proves that I'm God, I'm outside time. Yeah. I'm sovereign over history. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, it's undeniable, really, if you look at it. All right. Well, tonight, as I say, we are live. It's 9th of October, <coughs> so it's Monday night, and uh, you know, we just want to invite you to write in, live at revelationtv.com, and obviously the text number, which is always going to come up on the screen. Ask the questions that you've always wanted to ask and never really got an answer for when we're talking about Bible prophecy. You've got to stay to the point because this tonight's guest is a specialist in this, so don't waste the time talking um, or asking questions that are not pertinent to Bible prophecy, where we are in the, in the stream of uh, man's history. Are we living in an end time age, which Jesus talked about in Matthew 24 and the other scriptures there? Um, something that turns you into um, a specialist in end times. Uh, what, how did you, did you do that almost from the beginning, Derek? Well, it isn't, 
something I set out to do. You know, when, as a pastor, I teach on Across a whole the range of things. Yeah. I'm not like teaching on prophecy all the time. Mm. I think one thing is that it's I like to study every area of the Bible, and Bible teachers like Derek Prince and Roger Price were inspirational to me, and. A lot of pastors don't teach on Bible prophecy, so there's a real vacuum. So I, but for me, I've got to understand this stuff. So I found myself studying it uh, in, in depth, and I've, I've recently done a big book on it called A Panorama of Prophecy, and um, there's like 600 pages. But I suppose it's, it's not like I am just a prophecy teacher. Um, I, I like to think of myself as covering the whole counsel of God. But uh, I guess it's just happened, really, that uh, this, because it's an area that isn't covered well, generally, in the body of Christ, I, I felt that, and there's so much speculation, that I felt drawn to really develop the subject systematically, you know. Well, it <coughs> is good that you do what you do, because there is a, a, a hole there to be filled. and. Many people who would go to church, uh, particularly, say, uh, in the Orthodox churches, Anglican, Catholic, whatever, um, the pastors or the priests don't teach. Why do you, on the coming of the Lord, the second coming, mm. uh, why do you think that is? It, I, I think it's a lack of confidence. It's got to be. Uh, they don't think it's wacky Maybe they're in any not way. taught at Bible school on that. Um, that. I think there's the, the problem is we have from baggage from church history that from the time of Augustine in the Catholic Church, and then that carried through into the historic Protestant churches, the, uh, the sense of spiritualizing scripture, so that in other areas of doctrine we take scripture literally, but in the area of prophecy, we don't. There's no thousand year reign of Christ, that's a spiritual language for heaven or for the church age. And so now, Bible prophecy is devalued because we, we interpret it mystically. We don't take it literally. And that's carried, that, that affects people. And so, in a way, people say, well, the only thing to say is that one day Jesus will come again and that will be it. And then we're into eternity. And so it's not really given much attention because there's nothing to say. And yet, a third of the Bible is Bible prophecy. So it's got to be important. I always think of faith, hope, and love, you know, that one third is hope. Hope for what is Bible prophecy. Exactly, Bible yes. prophecy gives us hope. It gives us the vision of the future. It shows us what God is like. It's future history. So God reveals himself through what he does. And just as much he's revealed himself through what he's done in Bible history, he reveals what he's like in Bible prophecy with all the judgments he's going to do, the resurrections, how he's working his purposes out. It's exciting stuff. So it's such a shame that it's ignored, really. Mm. Uh, again, uh, lots of greetings coming in, but what we want to do is hear what are the questions that you've had on your mind, um, maybe for years, or, or some of them are just coming about, because we, we hear all sorts of things in the news today, which uh, is very disturbing, and as uh, Derek was saying, you know, we, we need to have some sort of hope for the future, if not for ourselves, our grandchildren, our children, uh, what hope is there for them when you look at the world today, whether you're looking at the ecology, whether you're looking at the economy, or whether you're looking at uh, jobs or future housing, whatever it is, it doesn't, it does look very grim. Um, so what is the answer to man's problems? One thing that uh, I cottoned onto when I was studying the scriptures was when you came across uh, men that uh, were quite I suppose, profound, and, and uh, there were people that were well known for their intellect, like, um, um, I always forget the guy's name, uh, four or five hundred years ago, Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac right. Newton. When he looked at scripture, mm. he took it seriously. Yes. Now, he there's spent a more name. time on studying prophecy and revelation and so forth. Yeah. Now, with that uh, as a uh, something to say, well, hang on a sec, if, if somebody is going to be moved to study the Bible and take it seriously, um, then ought we not to do the same? Mm. Um, so what would you say to people today who, you know, are looking at the world um, with, you know, just some, a little bit of fear for the future? What scriptures would you, or prophecies would you point them to, Derek? 
Um, Christians. Yeah, or, or, or anyone, yeah. because I mean, there might some, sometimes we have people that are just just tuning into a Christian television program like tonight. And Pro just I mean, prophecy um, in the Bible is a massive subject. Like I said, the um, there are the prophecies of the Messiah in the Old Testament, which are very rewarding. But in terms of end time prophecy, you've got Jesus's own prophecy is 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 crucial in called the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark, Mark 13. 13. Um, then Daniel's 70 weeks, although that's especially hard prophecy, even Jesus said, let the reader understand. In other words, you, you've got to study this one. I've written a book especially on Daniel's 70 weeks because it's, it's, it's kind of crucial to, to really understand prophecy. And of course, the book of Revelation, which is not a hard book. It's it's called the Book of Revelation, not the Book of Obscurity. Very Just good. if we take it mm. in its normal language but and some not try and create funny things with it. Some theologians <coughs> have said it's a book for fools. I remember for when fools. I first started to read that, they said, oh no, this is a book for fools. Mm. You must, and, and miss the whole uh, revelation, well, it, really. You know how it ends, of Jesus course. Christ. If anyone adds to this or takes away, in other words, God yeah. takes it very seriously. If anyone adds to it, then certain... Uh, Unfortunate things will be added to their life. And if you take away from it, then things will be taken away from them. And blessed is he who reads the words of this book. See, it, you know, you're guaranteed a blessing here. But it's a big subject. You can't just, um, the problem is that people quickly uh, come up with theories uh, rather than just study it systematically and take it in its plain meaning. Um, people get titillated by the latest kind of weird way of understanding it and uh, and so we've got all these conflicting ideas and that I think puts some people off and some pastors off they to answer your original question they they don't feel confident in that area and they don't think it's that important I, that, I think <coughs> the latter is uh, for me what I think uh, they're thinking about um, and also I think it takes a lot of effort to understand, to study the Bible in the first place, to understand it enough uh, and to make it your own that you understand these prophecies mm -hmm. to be able to then pass that on to your exactly. congregation as a pastor. Um, the, the questions are coming in. Thank you very much. This is live, 9th of October. I just want to make sure you know that so we're looking uh, to answer your questions. Well, Derek is. <laughs> uh, this is from Andy and he writes in, if we are in the end times, uh, do we think that the Antichrist has showed himself already? No. Um, my understanding is that although he may well be alive, I think he probably almost certainly is, uh, he will only show himself in such a way that, that it will be clear that he is who he is um, when, uh, after the rapture of the church. Uh, the Bible talks about the fact that when the restrainer is removed, then the, the spirit of Antichrist, um, will, the Antichrist will be revealed. And we see that at the book of Revelation, the rider on the white horse. The Antichrist uh, rises quickly to power and then he will um, make a covenant with Israel. And then halfway through the final seven years, he will break that covenant. He will defile the temple and declare himself to be God, to be worshipped, and bring in the mark of the beast, the image of the beast, the abomination of desolation. All these things are described as happening in the final seven plus years called the day of the Lord or, or the tribulation. And that's where Revelation chapter 6 to 18 is focused on. And we're not there yet, but we are moving toward that. You can, you can sense, and Jesus talked about how do you know if, how, that we're getting close, that we're in the end times. And he talked about trees. You see, in the tribulation, the Bible describes how, where things are heading. And in the tribulation, it's like the, all these trees, some good trees, some evil trees, they're bearing fruit like the fruit in the summer. So how do you know you're getting close to summer? He says, when you see these trees put Give forth back. their leaves. Mm -hmm. That's springtime, that's the time just before the summer. So he said, when you see all these signs, all the things that will come to their fullness in the tribulation, when you see them beginning to happen, 
then you know you're getting close. Everything's converging to a climax. And the one fig tree in particular that's the outstanding one, Jesus points out, is the fig tree, which, again, if you compare it with Luke 13, that is clearly Israel uh, throughout the scriptures. And so when you, in the tribulation, you see Israel is in the land. It's the center of action. Jesus returns to the Mount of Olives. Israel's a nation in the land. I mean, even that's a stunning prophecy that seemed impossible. Because, you know, Israel's been Israel, scattered for 1900 yeah. years. Yeah. So, therefore, since you have the Israel tree in the land, ultimately bearing fruit, coming to faith, then in the time just before the tribulation is marked by the fig tree putting forth its leaves. Not bearing fruit, not in faith, but Israel back in the land again as a nation. And that's what we saw in 1948. In fact, really, this is 100 years from 1917, which was the Balfour Declaration and major events that took place that was the beginning of these things, the rebirth of Israel, come out of the world wars. And so this is the sign of the end times. I believe the end times really began in World War I. That's the first nation against nation. kind of birth pang. Um, world War I is where everything changed. And that led into World War II, that led into the Holocaust, that led into the rebirth of Israel. And that's what Jesus was actually saying. The, that's when, the, in a way, the Braxton Hicks contractions began uh, that will lead to the full birth pains of the tribulation. But the fig tree and all the trees, Jesus said. When you see that, that this generation that sees that sign of the fig trees springing up and all the trees, this generation will not pass away until all these things are accomplished. That is saying it will be within a man's lifetime of all these things. And if so, you look at all the trees Jesus pointed to, they're all happening and they're all converging. To like One of them is the technology tree. You know, you kind of technology you see Daniel. in the tribulation. Mm -hmm. You see satellite TV, you see computers, you see the mark of the beast, you see... Um, you know, uh, well, I won't go into it, but a lot of high technology, weapons of mass destruction. And therefore, the time before, the hundred years before, say, must be m unique in the history of man in terms of the development of technology. And that's exactly what we've seen. I've always that's seen, just two examples. Yeah, I've always seen that uh, <clears throat> when you read Daniel chapter 12. Yeah. People to and fro, um, across the world, and also that the, the word would become abundant, you know, the knowledge. Yeah. You know, the knowledge, knowledge will increase. Yeah. Many will travel to and fro. Yeah. There you go. So, all right. Now, other ones coming in here. How do you calculate when you think the Lord will return by the prophecies in the Bible? Uh, and um, this is from Linda in North Wales. Yes, one, one of course, has to stay humble. Uh, in the sense that Jesus said, no one knows the day and the hour. I believe Jesus meant what he said there. We do not know, you know, the precise timing. We can make our guesses, we can speculate, we can try and discern, but we do not know. But um, there are certain guidelines, there are certain typologies. I just gave one, which was the idea that uh, it will be within a man's lifetime of a Israel's generation. rebirth. Uh, another thing I look to is the typology of a day with the Lord is a thousand years. You know, I've written this on my book on chronology, Bible chronology, the keys of time. And if you think of the creation week as being the blueprint for history, you have the six day, and this is what the Jews believed and the early Christians, um, the six days of the week are of man is like 6,000 years of history from Adam. And if you do that, and I've done the, ca the calculation on that, you know that the first four days ended with Christ's death and resurrection. And that kind of then leaves two days two to complete years. the six days. And then there's the seventh day, which of course is the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ. And so the fact that John says Christ will reign for a thousand years, it fits nicely into that pattern that the Jewish rabbis actually taught. And, um, and Peter also seems to confirm that when he says a day with the Lord. So if that's true, um, then that indicates the 2,000 years from Christ. Yes. Um, so, 
you know, we don't know its typology, yes. but the indications are, you know, pointing in that direction. And, and I think... It, the other one is Noah. There, Noah was given a 120-year warning. And, and it, in the same way, that's, a, that's the length of a man's lifetime. So there's a hint again that the end times aren't longer than a man's lifetime, as in the days of Noah. Okay, um, question here that's coming, it's only part of it's coming, but let me read it anyway. Hi folk, what is the difference between a messianic Bible and, a, 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 let's say, an ordinary one, a King James one? I'm sure that's what uh, this You know, lady I'm was not saying. totally sure, but I imagine that they will tend to use Hebrew sounding names, you know, and it's, it's really just a translation, but okay. they will use some of the Hebrew names rather than the, the English version of the names. But. Okay, Mark uh, from Bangor in North Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland uh, say, asks, uh, when millions of believers leave earth at the rapture, what will uh, those left behind think has happened? Well, on the positive side, really. this, the rapture, and I, as, as you know, I believe it happens before the final what's known as the tribulation or the day of the Lord. I prefer the day of the Lord because it's the time of God's judgment and, and the rapture is the bridegroom coming for his bride to save his bride from that coming judgment. Um, basically, that will be one of the greatest events of history when you think about it. Let's say, I believe there'll be a revival possibly leading up to that. A billion or more people suddenly disappear. That's going to be immense, especially when they realize it's, it's the Christians. So that's why many people get saved early in the, in the tribulation, especially those 144,000 Jews. They've got to get saved very early on. They spearhead the evangelism in the tribulation. But in don't no they come out? Revelation 7. Of the great tribulation. Well, no. The 144,000, first of all, are sealed. They're protected while they have their witness, particularly in the first half. Then you see the vision of all the, the people who get saved as Standing a result of that throne, outreach. Yeah. And, and many of them are martyred in the Great Tribulation. And, and that's why it says they, they come out of the Great Tribulation. And so they're pictured in heaven, but they are, the, they are the converts and they are martyred because they don't take the mark of the beast. And so then they're, they're in heaven. So we see many people saved. Jesus said the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all nations. And he's, the context is the Tribulation actually when in Matthew 24 at least, many will be saved. And the rapture is a major reason for that. That will be an amazing event. That will, that will, and now of course, no doubt the, the enemy will come up with some clever UFO, you know, <laughs> explanation, explanation yes, that the earth is gone. being cleansed of all these, you know, yes. people who are, who are getting in the way of the evolution of the planetary consciousness, <laughs> or something like that. But, I, but actually, it will have a tremendous result of many people being saved. Yeah, because I have a knowledge, I'm sure, there's, I mean, there's never been so many Christian channels uh, in our existence, uh, uh, except uh, today, if you think about it. So people will have a knowledge, exactly. uh, whether they agree with it or not is another matter, but at least when the when rapture it happens, happens they'll go, my goodness, we, this, is, this is what's happened. Exactly, okay. it'd be hard to explain away. Yeah. Um, does Damascus have to fall soon, obviously, because of that prophecy that it would be destroyed? Yeah, we don't know when. The hardest thing with interpreting prophecy is putting the timing on it. Um, so that, that Damascus will be destroyed. In fact, it's a very, very large very part of it has been already, destroyed. Already, hasn't it? Yes. Um, but it not may, too it, far away. we don't know, you see. Mm. It might be in the tribulation. So we can't be sure you know, when exactly, but you're right. Isaiah 17 predicts the destruction of Damascus and that's never been fulfilled, but it is partially fulfilled already. I mean, it's been destroyed in a remarkable way, but yes, it will either be at this time that it will be destroyed or, or in the tribulation. What does Derek think uh, will happen then also to Iran and North Korea in relation to the end times, asked Judith? Well, we don't know, really, North Korea, as far as I can tell, is not directly mentioned. But Iran is, of course, and 
they are connected, they are helping each other on the nuclear front. So uh, Iran is the, well. the real uh, thing that seems to be that they will be part of this invasion from Russia, led by Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, other nations, and other nations. So, um, I mean, I, I believe I've seen some... What I didn't understand about that invasion is that if these nations invade Israel and cover the land and then God destroys those armies, this is Ezekiel 38. This is a major, this is the thing I'm looking, that this is a prophecy that must be fulfilled, quite probably before the rapture, can't be sure. Um, you know, this is going to be a big event and revival is going to come out of it. It's going to be so dramatic. But I thought, well, how come Israel isn't destroyed by that? And then I realized that it doesn't say Israel, it says the mountains of Israel. Now, the mountains of Israel is actually the West Bank. It's where the settlements are. And so this is the land of unwalled villages. This is the, not Israel proper, as it were, but it's the disputed territory. So the reason for the invasion will be to enforce the UN resolutions and set up a Palestinian state. Russia will take the initiative, and say, well, America's done this kind of stuff before. We're doing it now. The Islamic nations will, will join with Russia. In fact, the, most of the world will applaud it because they are enforcing a Palestinian state. That's what's going to happen. So they're going to invade West Bank, the mountains of Israel. God's going to say, hang on. Enough. <laughs> Enough. That's my, the line. This is my land. And God's going to intervene. The settlers and the people living there will actually run to safety to Israel proper because they're not invading Israel proper. That's why Israel doesn't fight back. Uh, and so there'll be an overwhelming invasion of the mountains and then God's going to deal with those armies. And it will be a demonstration of God's, um, that the God of Israel, the God of the Bible is, is still very much alive and well. And that will be a, a trigger for a great revival. Questions are coming in, thick and fast. Thank you very much. Keep them coming. Live at revelationtv.com and the text number is on the screen for your messages. Uh, in the coming uh, of the Antichrist, uh, likely, is it likely to involve some sort of alien delusion, asks Mark? I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I think that's a good answer, yeah. to be honest. Um, okay. That isn't what is um, particularly focused on by the Bible, put it that way. <coughs> Can you explain Revelation 10 verses 3 and 4 if the book of Revelation is the unveiling, why is this bit hidden? Uh, many thanks. Revelation 10 we'll have to uh, check. verse 3 and 4. Let me read that and see what that's about first. And uh, No name on this one, but thank you for putting your questions. We're looking forward to receiving so. as many as we can before the hour is up. Shall I read it? Yes, um. please. Well, this is talking about uh, this a mighty angel that some believe is Christ. And uh, he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. And when he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. So, yes, God... Um, oh, it's annoying in a way, isn't it? It's like, yeah, yeah well, what do these seven thunders say? But then it's not given to us. All I conclude from that is that what, you know, the Bible is very selective. And although the, the book of Revelation really sets out the order of events very nicely for us. But in a way, that saying, there are judgments and there are things that God's going to do in the, in the day of the Lord that actually w are not revealed that will only no, be revealed when detail. they actually happen. Right. You know, and that's true generally, isn't it? That uh, God reveals certain things will happen. But even when he tells us in our own lives, you know, I'm going to do this, there's so much that he doesn't reveal. And in the same way, there are, there are, there are things that are going to happen that, that we don't, we're not told about. But the Bible, <clears throat> uh, it's not vague. It, no. It, there are some very um, well-described events that are going to happen yeah. in the future. Uh, so it's, but there are some, to be honest. God, God gives us what we need to know. He, he doesn't share things to titillate us, mm -hmm. but he, he gives us what, what needs to know. So what these seven thunders are, 
will be revealed in due time. But God does hold certain information back for, for, for good reasons, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, this, um, this is quite a long one, Tina. I don't, I'd have to, I don't think I'd be able to read all that. I would take the rest of the, the hour up. But uh, <laughs> let me see if I can come back to it. Uh, Judith's asking a question which I really, I think you've already answered, uh, which is the possibility of uh, North Korea um, if there's, if it makes war, where does it fit in Bible prophecy? Well, it, it doesn't specifically, it doesn't, does it? No. It's part of the nations will rise against each other, wouldn't it? Um, to That's make right. war, so, and rumours of wars. Um, Sophie, please could you confirm if Matthew 24 applies to our time? I heard preachers say that it does not, uh, uh, but it applies to the first church times in the first uh, century. That's a good question and uh, that's a common confusion. Uh, if you look at the Olivet Discourse, you have to compare the three Gospel accounts together. Uh, that's true for harmonizing the Gospels. There are three questions the disciples ask. Number one, the temple, Jesus was just saying the temple will be destroyed. And they're saying, when, what's the sign for the temple to be destroyed? Number two, What's the sign of your coming? Mm. Uh, you know, what events so are going to lead up to question. your second coming? Mm. That's the second question. Then the third question, which sounds similar, but it's actually different. What's the sign of the end of the age? Right. That's, that's the word for the consummation of the age, which is another name for the day of the Lord. Um, in other words, how do we know in the church age when we're getting close to that end? That's the third question. And Jesus answers all these questions in turn. And if you put the whole thing together, and I do cover this in my book on the panorama of prophecy, um, you'll see that he answers the first question about the temple in Luke 21. And he talks about the sign being the Jerusalem stakes. being surrounded by yeah. armies. Yes. And that actually happened in AD 66, and then those That's armies right. withdrew. Mm -hmm. And then the Christians in the gap Mm -hmm. Those armies came back in AD 70, yeah. destroyed Jerusalem, but the Christians had the warning from Jesus and they to had the out. chance to escape and they did. Absolutely. In AD 68, they went to Pella, a million Christians' was, lives were saved uh, because of this prophecy. But when you, then, when you go to Matthew 24, there is some similarities, but this is talk, he's talking about the end time sign. And in that case, and people confuse these two, you see. So in Luke 21, he does the first century fulfillment. But in Matthew 24, he gives the end time fulfillment because he says, when you see the abomination of desolation, okay, that's, the, that's different from Jerusalem being surrounded by armies. This is a different sign in the end times. When you see the abomination of desolation, flee to the mountains. Mm -hmm. And so this is the end time sign when the Antichrist, halfway through the tribulation, he will set up his abomination in the temple, which will probably be an idol to himself, the image of the beast in the holy place. And at that time, you see, uh, that's when uh, that applies to the end times. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the answer to the second question is, what are the events leading up to the second coming? And that's, that tells you you're three and a half years away, yeah. basically. You could understand. So people confuse. Yeah, the but you two. could understand how they could do that because it yeah. would. It could look like the, all, all of those three ma main events that Jesus foretold were fulfilled by the year seven, 70 AD. Yeah. Well, some people teach that the preterists, but yeah. they have. They can only do that by abandoning literal interpretation. Luke twenty one. That was literally fulfilled about what I described. But if you start, but the preterists say you know, the abomination of desolation, even Jesus coming in power and glory, mm -hmm. they say that was fulfilled yeah. <laughs> mystically in the destruction you, of Jerusalem, you know, but they are abandoning literal interpretation and yeah. I can't accept that. And you can't abandon the fact that this great tribulation such as never occurred before mm. in human history has not happened yes. yet. Again, they apply so, that to AD 70. Which but you see, silly. that wasn't, that would never happen again. We've had greater tribulations exactly. than that, haven't exactly. we? So it was, uh, Pitiful compar comparison, really. I always say, if you just stick to literal interpretation, which means interpret it according to its plain meaning, mm. then you won't go too far wrong. Right. Okay. Uh, there's so. Uh, thank you so much for your wonderful programs. I've learned so much and have been very blessed. Uh, 
Uh, please, can Derek expand on what happens to believers during the thousand-year reign of Christ in terms of our family units, etc.? Uh, will people uh, keep having children, or will it be just those living who have lived in the past uh, be able to have children? The yeah, Bible's so very clear on that, isn't the it? The believers who are alive uh, in the now, we will have our, we'll be in our resurrected bodies at this stage. Uh, or even those who died during the tribulation, the martyrs, they will have their resurrection bodies. And it says they will rule and reign with Christ. You see, when Jesus returns, the, ange the principalities and powers, the fallen angels that now rule the darkness of this world, they'll be removed from their positions. Not, it's not just Satan that's thrown into the abyss. All of his angels and demons will be in the abyss. And they'll let we loose will, at the end of the thousand years. We will then right. occupy those places of authority over, we'll rule and reign with Christ. So whether we, ha in our resurrection body, we're not married, maybe we'll have a special closeness to our families, we, you know, we just don't know. But that will, our home is heaven, if you like, the New Jerusalem, but our, our work, <laughs> is actually ruling and reigning with Christ. But the people who, are, who are, are alive at the second coming on the earth, they will go into the millennium. You know, Jesus will separate the sheep from the goats. So these are the people who are alive. At the end of the tribulation, so many people will be killed, it'll be much less than the present population of the earth. But then the sheep and the goats are separated. The sheep, those who believe in, in the Messiah, they will now inherit that kingdom and they will repopulate the earth. There'll be very little death during the thousand years. So the population might, will grow from a, maybe a hundred million. It will grow. They'll, they'll have children and they'll be in their natural bodies and they'll have families, but it will be peace. It will be peace, prosperity. It will be a spiritual time. The glory of God will cover the earth. Uh, but they will be in their natural human bodies, and the children that are born will need to get saved. They'll need to hear the gospel. That's good, because it explains really why when Satan's let loose at the end, mm. uh, just for a little while, he has an opportunity then to, to sift, if you like, yes. those again who've come through to the end of the thousand years, right? Exactly. So many who are born during that time, Although they outwardly conform, because Christ will rule with a rod of iron, it will be a righteous government, that although they may conform, they, in have their hearts, choice, they be. haven't surrendered their heart to Christ as their Lord. And so when Satan is released, he has the opportunity, in a way, the right to test every man in Adam, mm -hmm. to see what, the, and that's the spiritual warfare over every soul. That's the, every listener here, they're in the middle of a spiritual warfare. During their lifetime, they have to make the choice to be God positive, to be Christ positive, or God negative, or Christ negative. Will they accept salvation, or will they try and justify themselves? And depending on that is their eternal destiny. There's this amazing scripture that says, where the tree falls to the north or to the south, that's where it will stay. In other words, when you die, when you die, when you as a tree falls, if you're pointed toward God in your death, that's where you will be eternally. If you fall against God, then that's where you will be eternally. And so Satan will, will those who have actually rejected Christ in their heart, that will be revealed when Satan is released. What about those? I know we know the answer, but for people who are perhaps <coughs> thinking, well, do you know, um, my dad, my mom, my sister, my brother, my cousin, or whatever, uh, were good people, but they didn't know, as we would say, the Lord. Mm. They hadn't made that commitment. Um, will they be there in that new millennium? Um, well, we, we can, we, the only assurance we can have is that, you know, Jesus said, no man knows, I'm the tr way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the no Father, one comes except, to the through Father except through me. Mm. So we can have no assurance about somebody yeah. if they didn't put their trust in Christ. Because we don't know a man's heart. We don't know if they received Christ and how they responded in their heart. So I'd rather leave that up yeah. to God, you know. But Thank basically, <laughs> salvation is through Christ alone. Yeah. And so without him, important. we have no hope. You know, it's we important must preach to the gospel. talk to our relatives, yes. really, yes. Um, and friends. 
And that's what makes us, um, has the, I suppose, we have to have a heart for their salvation, yes. really, and, uh, and take it seriously that we do it whilst we can make hay while the sun shines, so Absolutely. to speak. Hi, Derek. I recently read uh, that a lot of rock musicians uh, that I like are anti-God. Should I get rid of the CDs? Well, the, uh, that's between you and the Lord, really. But if your conscience convicts you, and the, mostly judge it by the lyrics, um, if the lyrics are anti-God, then yes. I was reading but, that, um, was it um, Lady Gaga or something was uh, made a pact with the devil or something? And, I don't know. Well, the, the other problem we face is that you... not a bad guy, really. He's misunderstood, I think, was the headline in the paper the is? other day. This is what, I think it was Lady Gaga yeah. or somebody like that well, was saying about Satan. He was, he's a good guy. Really? You know? yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? See how... Um, the influences can come through those that, who are, are, are raised, uh, you know, in people's expectations and their role model mm. that are um, putting anti-God uh, rhetoric out there and uh, even pointing people to befriend Satan. I mean, it's that... It's, it's, it's tricky because also on the internet there's a lot of false accusation about people. That's a good and point. And one needs to not just believe everything that you read on the internet. <laughs> Definitely not. Pastor Derek, please give me a timeline of the book of Revelation. Uh, have you got all night? Okay. <laughs> For what has already happened and what is taking place now and what is yet to come? Uh, ask Karen. So well, it's it's very one. simple really because Revelation 1.19 gives you the structure and it basically says write the things that you see, which is chapter 1, he, the vision of Christ. Then he's told to write the things which are now which is the seven letters to the seven churches, which encompass the church age. In my book, Panorama of Prophecy, I do an appendix where I show the, how the seven letters actually give a kind of overview of the whole church age. And then it says, write the things which must take place after this, after the church age. And then when you read Revelation 4 verse 1, where John is caught up into heaven, um, he is told, that he is now about to, to see what will take place after this. So that's when the future aspect. So what's now is the church age, which is Revelation 2 and 3. Revelation 4 introduces us to heaven just before the day of the Lord, um, the judgments. And Revelation 5 is all about what the seven, the seven seals is all about that introduces us, the action in heaven, and then the judgments are released on earth, which is Revelation 6 to 18. But we're not there, we're not in the seals. The structure of Revelation is the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls. That gives you the sequencing. But we're, that hasn't started yet. We're not in the day of the Lord yet. It's still the day of grace of, you know, um, of re, you know it's not a time of judgment yet. Okay, uh, Derek, could you please explain uh, the scripture where it says there were two uh, in a bed, one taken and one left behind, uh, from a post-trib and pre-trib uh, stand, trying to get an understanding which one of it is it is that this scripture seems to um, explain. Or this is from Andrew. Now it is a bit confusing because you could say the one that was taken was that taken uh, by the Lord uh, in a positive way? Mm. Uh, were they That's removed? what I believe. Yeah. I mean, there are different beliefs even among pre-tribbers on yeah. this. But I, I'm convinced from the whole passage that Jesus here is talking about the rapture, that one is taken, the other oh. left. Some people compare it to where the word taken is in a nearby verse, where it talks about in the time of Noah, they, the, the evildoers were taken by the flood. But in the Greek, it's a different word. The word in the, in the Greek for take, you know, one is taken, the other left, is the same word that's used for Joseph taking Mary to be his wife. Okay. So in other words, it's actually talking about Jesus, the bridegroom, taking his bride to be with him. The others are left, left behind, mm, to go yeah. through the tribulation. That's my understanding. Good question. Um, good answer. That's the pre-trib view. Um, this is from Colin. Hi, what does it say in the Bible about the meek will inherit the earth? Are we talking about this earth or uh, will it be too far gone with destruction and I suppose 
with uh, ruining our environment? Is it on its way out? Or will there be another planet that we're going to be inheriting? Well, this is... In, I apply this two ways. I mean, it's... You, meek will impregnate the earth. That means if you, in our life now, we are meek, we are teachable, we are humble, we will have success in life. It's those who... Uh, the meek will, will are those who, uh, you know, take the time to get trained to, to learn from those who know what they're talking about, then you will find success in this life. But it's actually talking prophetically about the millennium because, yes, this, this planet is falling apart, but when Jesus returns, he will restore it to like it was originally in the Garden of Eden. And it will be a wonderful planet at that time. And the meek, the sheep, the meek, the believers who've, who've submitted themselves to Christ, they will inherit the, this kingdom, this messianic kingdom on earth. So that's the prophetic application of it. So when Peter is talking about chapter 2, verse 3, uh, Second Peter chapter 3 mm. is talking about the earth there being dissolved or...? Yes, at the end of the, the day of the Lord. So in Peter, it's interesting, this will help. The day of the Lord, there's two days, there's the short day of the Lord, which is the tribulation. And then there's the long day of the Lord, which is the thousand years. Uh, and then the day of God is the eternal state. So what he says in Peter is that the day of the Lord begins with, as a thief in the night. That's the rapture. And then you've got the thousand year day of the Lord. And then God will dissolve this present universe. He will burn up this universe. That's at the end of the, of the, the day of the thousand years. That's the great white throne judgment, the destruction of this universe. And then God will create a new heavens and a new earth that is the eternal state. And that's called the day of God. Right. Because so, the day of the Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when he will reign under the Father. But then he hands the kingdom over to the Father, it says in Corinthians. And then it's the day of God in eternity. Fantastic. Yeah. We're only just scratching the surface tonight. We're, we're almost out of time. But let me just uh, say, uh, you've got the Oxford Bible Church website there. And uh, please make sure that you also watch the program that Derek does uh, on a Wednesday night. It's at 8.30. 8.30. And repeated Tuesday at 10, 10 in the morning. In the morning. Right. Uh, Derek, you've also got something very quickly to announce on uh, something that's on the air. Yes, uh, there's a controversy about where the temple it was located, and I've waded into the middle of that one myself uh, on, on the internet and so forth, and I prepared a special documentary that Revelation TV is very kindly showing uh, after our Wednesday evening program at 9 o'clock this Wednesday. It's a one-and-a-half-hour documentary that really gives the whole history of the temple and, and why we know where the temple is is and where the temple will be rebuilt soon uh, because the Bible prophecy says there will be a rebuilt temple and God is going to use that temple as a witness to, to the nations before the Antichrist messes it up. But God will nevertheless use it. It's called the temple of God. So it's Wednesday night. So Wednesday night, 9, nine o'clock for Wednesday. an hour and a half. Yeah. Okay, don't miss that yeah. uh, because it will be in-depth uh, explanation as well because Derek is a good, really good Bible teacher. May I say. Thank you. Um, yeah, and very, very welcome. It's good to have you on the program, Derek. And I also just thank want to you. say to our viewers, thank you for writing in so many. And uh, we, we just scratched the surface. Honestly, look, just still um, 20 or 30 the, that we haven't been able to get to. Well, 40 seconds left. What would you say to our viewers just to encourage them to get stuck into understanding the Bible? Seek Christ. The Bible's all about Christ. And if you seek him, you'll find him. And just ask him. Open your eyes as you, as you read the word of God. He wants to reveal himself to you. Just have a heart. But you have to have a heart that's open to him and ready to submit to him as he speaks to you. Look to Christ. Mm. He's the answer. Amen. Stay tuned to Revelation TV where you'll learn a lot more about scriptures and give you a hope for the future that is so positive for you, your sons and your grandsons and grandchildren. Take care. God bless.